Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth lecture in the Systems Dynamics course. Before we start, as usual, a few announcements. <laughs> um, now, on Monday, I went to the dentist. And uh, no, I mean, I, I still suffer. So I be actually, I cannot open my mouth so much. That's as much as I can open it. So if at some point you don't understand what I'm talking about, just stop me and, uh, and say something. That's uh, one thing. Second thing, I would like to remind the presenting groups from last week to upload their student solutions. At least I didn't see them yesterday, I think in the evening. Um, is there anybody from these groups who presented last Tuesday? Have you uploaded your solutions? Because, I mean, there may also be a problem with the Moodle system, because uh, I may have set up the wrong things. So I want to know if you have problems uploading it or you just didn't, didn't bother. But uh, I hope you, you will upload it by the end of this week. Another administrative thing, this is the fourth lecture. So after the fourth lecture, um, we'll have an online test. I already talked about these online tests. Uh, the online test will probably be prepared tomorrow. And you will have maybe from four to six hours to complete it, which is plenty of time anyway. Um, in addition to that, there will be more about the online test. Uh, I will send an email around. In addition to that, uh, there would be an online survey, which is the other quality control that we do in this course, where you kind of evaluate me. And it will also probably become available tomorrow, uh, or maybe on Saturday, I don't know. And then you'll have one week to complete this online survey. It's going to be a mixture of multiple choice questions and um, kind of a manual text input, where you can write comments and stuff like that. And then we all discuss, so it, of course it's anonymous, even to me it will be anonymous. This is the point. Uh, but then we'll all discuss the aggregate results. And I'll show you um, what, the, what the majority thinks. All right. Are there any questions? Yeah. The online test. you will have, let's say, four to six hours after you start it, but the, the whole online test would be available for maybe a week. So you will have one week to start it. But then once you start it, you have, yeah, four to six hours. If, if you don't think, if you, if you try to find everything on the slides, it would take you maybe about 30 minutes. I think, about 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. But um, yeah, the point of these online tests is not um, to make it possible to fail them, unless, of course, you don't want to do them, which is, uh, there is nothing we can do about it. The point of the online test is to simply make you go through the slides. And just by going through the slides and find information, you automatically remember something. All right. Are there any questions regarding the previous lectures for self-studies? Because today we kind of uh, start a new topic. You can ask questions later and also you can ask any questions during the self-studies regarding the lectures. So let me start. Uh, today I'm going to be using a fancy presenter because uh, those of you who have seen the slides, you, you saw that there are diagrams and kind of drawings that you know I simply need to navigate through. And if I use this laser pointer, uh, you can see, but the people watching the recording cannot see. Uh, so this, is, this kind of makes it very difficult for people to, to follow these this lectures uh, only uh, with the podcasts. So with this thing, I can do a lot of fancy things. For example, I can do like a spotlight thing, right? So for example, this is lecture four. I can, uh, what was it, I can zoom in. This is the professor. 
Yeah. And this is the email that you should send all your questions to. So yeah, th lots of cool things. It kind of makes it difficult to navigate because when I move it, the cursor moves. But anyway, these are petty concerns. All right, let's start. Again, as I will do in every lecture until the end, and as you should expect from me uh, in every lecture until the end, uh, a summary of what we've done so far. We've looked at um, mostly finding solutions to problems that we already discussed, their nature. Um <coughs> these are complex problems, non-trivial problems, multiple criteria problems, and we looked at ways to analyze the situation, to analyze the, the, the problem and find solutions for it, and then um, select what we hope to be the better solution finally implemented. We looked at the problem-solving cycle as a framework for um <coughs> for um, coming up with solution approaches and selecting solution approaches. We started with project management last lecture. Today we're going to finish project management. It's mostly about implementing solutions. Uh, we looked at how projects can be scheduled from time perspective, so the critical path method. Today we're going to be, think, uh, we're going to be talking about some deficiencies of the critical path method and how we can address them. Hopefully you know the critical path method is the thing which determines your project duration and we can also deal artificially, of course, with uncertainty in the critical path method by using this kind of buffers and floats, or buffers or floats. So if you, if you have uncertainty, you can just allocate more buffers, which is kind of artificial because the nature of uncert uncertainty is something that you know you cannot really predict, so the question is kind of paradoxical. How can you allocate buffer for something that you can't really predict? But this is a one deficiency of the critical path method. What buffers are good for, however, is to shuffle resources around. So if you have a critical activity with no buffers or critical, yeah, with zero buffers, then you can shift some of the resources from tasks with a lot of float to it and then hopefully speed up the whole process. We saw an example um, in the last lecture and probably there would be a similar task uh, required in the exam. All right. <coughs> and the rest of the course is basically going to be about studying, studying our solution. Uh, this should be just one question mark. Uh, this is not like a super existential question, but this is what the, the, next uh, the, the rest of the course is going to be about. Does the solution work? And if not, who is to blame? And I particularly like this lecture, today's lecture, because there's going to be an example precisely of this situation. The solution doesn't work, and two parties argue whom to blame. And they actually argue and settle this in court. And they use systems dynamics to do this, which is pretty amazing. Uh, they use modeling and uh, stuff like this, which reminds me, that today we're also going to be introduced to modeling, this system dynamics model that I talked about. Um, you will not have to do any models for the self-study, not yet, uh, but this is just a flavor of the models we're talking about, the so-called uh, system level models. We model the whole system, not the individual elements within it. All right. <coughs> As I promised you last week, we're going to focus a little bit more on quality management. So quality. Last week we saw how time constraints can influence our, our project. Today we're going to see how quality constraints are going to influence our projects. Um, and the quality, I mean, what is, what is quality control in, in simple terms? In a kind of intuitive notion. What, what do you understand when somebody tells you, yeah, our project needs quality control. Yeah. Yes, that's true. And then what do you do after you measure the outcome? Yeah. 
position or outcomes of your policy control would be really interesting of what what you would have expected as a result. And if expectations don't match reality? Then uh, you have two options. We generally we define the problem into one or two categories. One of which is it actually something that is required for your delivery of as a solution? Or is it something that is that is there as an issue and you can you can work with it? And or or is something like is it something that is like a critical part of the project so you cannot really deliver it? What if it's something that is needed? You need to deliver it, but it doesn't work as you expect it. Then, then you have to stop the delivery and you have to fix it. Fix it is good enough. I was looking for the for the term go back and fix it. Because quality control is nothing more than a feedback loop. And today we're also going to be introduced uh, to feedback loops, which is going to be expanded in next lectures. But quality control is simply a feedback loop. So you at some point in your project, and what these points are is also going to be introduced. You check your expectations in terms of quality. If something doesn't work, you just go back and fix it. It's not as simple as that, of course. Sometimes you can't fix it. Sometimes you need to account for propagating changes along your project. Um, but this is what quality control represents, a feedback loop, nothing more. <coughs> so today, what, what we saw already is uh, kind of a sequential approach to project scheduling, right? We saw the critical path method. Uh, we saw the, uh, how you can break a project into subtasks. And these subtasks were either um, sequential completely or fully concurrent, fully parallel, right? If you remember the critical path, you can have, you can have a whole chain of tasks which are fully sequential, or you can have two tasks which are completely concurrent, com completely parallel, but nowhere in between. What this lecture is going to be about is the so-called multi-phase projects. Because I you see, in every big project, you, you can't just split things into, into subtasks and blindly going through all the subtasks. If you build a garage, like we saw the example in last lecture, maybe you can do this. But if you have to build a, a tunnel, which spans 15, 20 years, or if you have to produce some software product or a microchip, you need to do more than, than just splitting into activities and tasks, and you need to do these kind of phases. And here uh, we're going to be talking about the project life cycle, which is nothing more than, than um, the human life cycle, right? As humans, you're born, you grow up, you're mature, eventually you decline, well, you decline and eventually you die. And it's the same with the project. It's conceptualized. This is one phase. Then it's designed, another phase. It's implemented. Um, and then it's finally it's decommissioned. So these are the multi-phase projects. And we're going to see that things get complicated when you have multiple phases, each with a different task. And um, this picture hopefully illustrates the idea. So here we have... Um, a project which starts from, oh, let's, let's try to do that now, which starts from here and then finishes here. And we have multiple phases within this project. It's up to you to define the phases. Different industries have different standards for defining uh, project phases. And within each phase, okay, I shouldn't use the pointer. Within each phase, we have a number of activities. So these are the activities that we talked about, right? For example, design phase, what do I need to do to design my product? The production phase, the same thing. And you can use the critical path uh, or, or this kind of uh, scheduling approaches within, within, each, within each phase. And let's in let me introduce some terminology. We have the so-called upstream and downstream directions. It's similar to supply chain. When you go upstream, you go to the producers of raw materials. When you go downstream, you go to the customers. And here's the same thing. When you go upstream, you go to the beginning phases of the project. When you go downstream, you basically go to the decommissioning or, or um, uh, yeah, getting the project out of the market. And here, quality control, this kind of feedback loops, can happen between phases, right? So let's say your, your production 
can spot some um, some kind of design flaws which are only available, which are only known at production stage, and then you feed back um, you feed back these inputs back to design, or you can have quality control within each within each phase. It's pretty intuitive. Uh, there there are going to be examples of this. However, these are what we call kind of unwanted feedbacks, right? Nobody wants to realize that at some point your quality or your project is delayed and then you have to go back and fix something. And what people normally do, since this is kind of an unwanted thing, they fall into a cer certain mental traps. We're going to be talking about mental tr these mental traps, but in essence it's, it's the idea that you don't want to spend too much resources going back, so you basically you settle for something suboptimal, right? What you said: Do we really need this thing? Uh, if we don't really need it, then we just don't care about it, which is already a problem because if you didn't really need it, then you shouldn't have put it in your milestone, uh, milestone, um, uh, in your milestones. But th the point of this slide is that we can have feedback loops between phases and within a phase. All right. <coughs> So how do we control for, for the success in terms of quality, in terms of time, between different phases, and also within a phase? And probably the MA students or also the master students with, uh, with work experience, you already know that people like to use this idea of milestones. Right? You can have milestones or checkpoints, uh, as many as you want, basically. Of course, there is again a fine balance between having too many milestones, too much paperwork, too much administrative overhead, and too few milestones, uh, which would basically leave a lot of deficiencies unspotted on time. But the milestone is simply a decision point. Uh, it's simply a checkpoint. And you can, for now, let's imagine we put the milestones between each phase, although this does not have to be the case. Two things happen at a milestone. You produce uh, some report outlining what this milestone have achieved, or what this milestone has achieved, um, and then you make a decision based on this report or deliverable. Here it's called deliverable, yes. And the decision, of course, may be: um, Do I go back and fix something? Do I stop the project, or do I just continue? Uh, as as uh, uh, because my milestone is 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 okay, and I think this idea is pretty intuitive. Um, at each deliverable or each report that you present to your managers or to your stakeholders in the project, would either consist of results, tangible results, like you've managed to implement some piece of software, you've managed to create a prototype of something, it works or it consists of some intangible results, depending on what, what your milestone is, right? It could be some, you come up with an idea how to approach a problem, you come up with a concept, with a model, things like this. But the important thing is, again, you have to be able to evaluate your milestones, just like you have to be able to evaluate your solutions. How we do this? Of course, objectives. Objectives are very important. You can only, you can be as precise as your objectives are, not more. All right, <coughs> so there are two ways, well, we're going to be looking at two ways to define milestones and to keep track of how each, the performance at each milestone. The first way is a very kind of visually appealing uh, and intuitive way. It's this uh, milestone trend diagram. So has somebody ever worked with the milestone trend diagram? Have you ever seen this? Hmm, no one, good. All right, the idea is pretty simple. Let's, let's try to explain it with this thing now. So on the x-axis, right, so this here is the big, or let's say this thing, is this here is the beginning of a project. This is time zero or time one, how, however you want to, to index that. This is the beginning of the project. Um, and the x-axis are the reporting dates. Reporting date, Dates meaning at each of these dates, so these are relative dates compared to the beginning of your project. So this is, let's say, two months after the beginning, three months after the beginning of the project, four, five, and so on. So at each reporting date, 
you ask yourself, how much is it going, how long is it going to take me to complete some milestone? Let's look at the green milestone, right? So in the beginning of your project, you ask uh, the team, let's say the project team, how long is it going to take you to complete the green milestone? And then they say, well, it's going to take me eight months after the beginning of the project. So if this is January, then eight months would be August. Then you say, okay, fine, you record that thing as a point. One month later, you ask the project team again, how long is it going to take you now? You've been already one month into the project. And they tell you again, well, it's going to take me eight months. I will finish again in August. The estimate holds. And then so on, three months, seven or six months. After six months, you ask them, how long is it going to take you to complete the project? They tell you, well, eight months, everything is fine. Right? You see already that this is a good thing. <coughs> the estimate never changed. So you were always on schedule. You didn't uncover or you didn't discover some kind of quality problems, time delays, unexpected consequences, things like this. So this is a good thing. Now let's look here. You can already see that uh, the revision of the estimated time needed to complete the black milestone increases as the project, as the project uh, 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 continues. So basically, when you ask the project team, how long is it going to, t in the fourth month, how long is it going to take you? Well, it's going to take me now four months, almost five months, even though in the beginning I told you it's going to take me three months. Right? So this is an example where a project is being delayed, has quality problems, uh, and, and uh, things like this which, cause this, which cause this shift in time. And the good case here is, well, we, we're going to see if that's really a good case, but basically <coughs> this is the opposite thing, right? So you ask the team and they constantly revise their schedule in a way that now your project takes l uh, less time. Is that clear? It's pretty intuitive, right? If it's clear, then can you tell me why there, there can never be any, any points in this half? in the lower half. Only after day three. Yes, uh, basically that's the reason. If for some at some point you find a point here, this means that either for, for you time is going backwards somehow or your project is out of date. So you ask, let's say in the eighth month, you ask uh, some team and they tell you, well, it's going to take me uh, five months after the start of the project to to finish that milestone, which means that this estimation is out of date. All right. <coughs> this was the milestone, mi milestone trend diagram. It's pretty intuitive. It's very simple. You can really spot, you can really spot delays as they appear. Of course, this depends on the granularity of, of your milestones, which brings me back to the point that two fine milestones can allow you to spot delays or quality problems almost in real time, but it will generate way too much administrative overhead. So you have to find a trade-off. If you just have two milestones in the beginning and then and at the end of the project, you will probably never, sp never spot any problems. Um, <coughs> it forces people to be disciplined, which may be or may not be a good thing depending on the culture of your company, of course. I would imagine, uh, I, I think that's similar to, to this Scrum methodology in software development, where you kind of force people to come up with exact, well, not exact, but quite reasonable estimates on how long they're going to need to complete a certain piece of work. Well, this is the same thing, basically. You ask them constantly to revise their estimations. And it kind of forces people and, and project teams to be more disciplined in their time management. But of course, again, this could be a negative thing. Um, 
you need to yourself, like the person doing this or the manager doing this, you need to be disciplined yourself because you have to collect all this data somehow. You have to constantly update it. Uh, so I I find this, or maybe that's that's the reason why this this approach is not used so much because it really requires a lot of discipline discipline from all the parties involved. <coughs> but again. Um, if if you have uh, experiences, please bring them forward. Another thing that you need to do um, in order for this trend diagram to work is you have to be aware that if there is a delay in the project, you spot a delay, you know that you have to go back and fix something. But this is much easier said than done because going back and fixing something involves feedback loops. So maybe the fix that you need to do is contingent on, on something else that needs to be changed more upstream. So you need to have an idea of how different feedback loops influence each other in your project. We're going to see how this is modeled. Um, but the conventional project management approaches tend to ignore this kind of uh, simultaneously operating feedback loops. All right, another way to keep track of our success or the milestone success is this so-called uh, integrated cost and date control. The idea is also simple. You have a you have a kind of a in this case it's a two-dimensional space with your important dimensions that you care about. For example, here we care about time and costs, but of course you can add as many dimensions as you want. This basically defines what success means to you what successful milestone means for you. And of course, um, you, s you put each milestone in this space, right? For example, here we have a milestone which took more time to complete and it cost more to complete. So that you can clearly say, well, that's a negative thing. Um, depending on how you weight the different dimensions, um, you can have you can basically have positive or negative effects attributed to tasks which violate one of these two dimensions. Here, we weight date or we, we weight time and costs equally. So if you have a task which fell short on one of the dimensions but made up for it in another dimension, we kind of say that this is neutral, right? It took more time to complete in this case, but it cost us less. So all in all, it's a neutral case. Of course, this depends entirely on how you weigh time and cost. And in most cases, this is not true. The same thing for here, right? You needed more money to complete your milestone, uh, but it, um, it, it took you less time. Here, we have the positive case where it took you less money and less time than planned. Is this really positive, though? Yes. I wouldn't call it a mistake. Although this may be the case, but I, I, I wouldn't like to call it a mistake. Yes. Positive meaning. Can you define that? At the end, you did not lost. You did not uh, save money, you save time, but uh, actually, uh, you did a bad project plan at the beginning. So, would you say this? W would we put such a milestone? Or would we say it's a positive, negative, neutral? What would you say? I agree. It is negative not because 
not only because you maybe made a mistake, uh, w which of course can happen, but it can also be negative on a different level. It could be, imagine you, uh, you talk to your customer and then your customer, after you deliver, your customer sees that you deliver earlier and it took you less money than planned. So what would the customer think? They would think, well, do you really know how to schedule your projects? This time it took you a lot less in both dimensions, but next time maybe it will take you a lot more. Furthermore, did you do it intentionally? You know, did you just try to sell success later on, right? By estimating more time, more money, and then sell me this success, uh, which was actually not a success really. It was just um, kind of an overestimation from your side in the beginning. So I find this as a kind of a negative thing to have. Even though you may not deliver to, out to an outside customer, even though you may deliver only within your own organization, this is still, I think, a bad, uh, a bad case. When you intentionally or unintentionally um, underestimate or overestimate the requirements. Yes, that's true. That is true. But the thing is, normally, um, when you have a multiple phase project, so let's say your customer wants a microchip from your side, right? Um, of course, you kind of constantly revise the schedule, but at some point at the end, let's say shipping, right? Just the shipping is needs to be done. This is kind of a self-sufficient phase. So you can even think that this is the end phase of your contract with the customer. Shipping is something that you can more or less estimate the costs and the time needed to ship the product. For instance, I can give you an example. Um, I recently, well, actually not recently, and that's the problem. Um, I ordered the laptop from Neptune, as probably many of you have done. So, But um, now it, it's been one month, I haven't got this laptop, and it's probably going to be at least half a month until I get it, because they have problems with the shipping. So in that case, you can say that they're somewhere here, right? So this is actually a, uh, an example going to, not to this point, but to the point that you can still estimate the end phase uh, with your customer. All right, so I wouldn't say this is a positive thing at all. Maybe, un yeah. I think it's generally positive if you, if you do an estimation on both the schedules, if you have a schedule and if you have an uh, estimated cost, generally it's positive. But if you assume you do this process plus a process time, then it's negative. Then your assumption may not be so right after all. Yes, but if you say <coughs> you assign the process in different uh, time, say for example, You agree that this is positive? Yes. Uh, my, my experience is in both technology. You never can plan a project that is finally on time. You always have some variation. Of course. And this, if this is the final point, the finish point, then it might have a negative aspect. But this is might be just one milestone. Of course, and yes. You have many others. And if you have such a point, you might also have some negative milestones and you can reallocate resources from this positive point. So finally, it's positive. That's my experience in practice. Uh, sure. But could you see, maybe, um, let's say, uh, if you run uh, in vertical, you had uh, the planned project and then In this case, uh, the plan actually not true. The result is good, but you yeah. never can so plan from the plan. project from the planning uh, point of view, it's um, I mean, at the end you have to actually uh, estimate uh, the times correct and the cost correct, and, uh, as well as the allocation of resources. 
I agree. This is actually a good point, and and you are part. You are right uh, in the sense that if this is an end phase of your project, like the very end thing that you do, then this this reasoning applies, right? But if it's the beginning, obviously, uh, it's not. Um, you can make up for this, or you can revise your project scheduling. So at the end, it may be it may even be positive thing. But I I I do think that. If that's the only phase in your project, it's a very simple project. Let's say, uh, can you can you write a simple program for me, and I'll pay you something. Uh, and then you you say, well, I'm going to need one month, and it's going to cost me one thousand francs. And then it takes you a week, and it costs you hundred francs. Um, then, uh, it of course, that's what people do exactly. True. Yes. I would say the positive is here, but of course you can never. Well, no, it's not binary. I, it, things can never be either completely positive or completely negative, right? So this could be, even if it's slightly here, it may be positive. You know, it, it contextual completely, of course. All right, but um, I just wanted to bring up this point with project scheduling, that sometimes going, uh, doing, uh, or let's say performing much better than what you projected uh, also needs uh, attention. So you need to revise the way you estimate things. <coughs> Finally, the, the final thing with, with the project management approach is this control gates. So basically, at, at the milestone, you take a decision. Should I continue or should I stop with the project? I did not, I did not fulfill my milestone. The quality is bad. I will not fit in the total project estimated time. So what do I do? Do we stop the project? Or for instance, you suddenly realize that your project has lost its market, its target market. Like the chip you are manufacturing cannot be sold now because it would be too big for the market, and you only find this out after the production phase, for instance. So what do you do? You stop the project, or you go back and you change something. And it really has to do with resources. Lots of time, you don't have enough resources to go back and to change your project. So what normally happens, what Ideally, should happen is you should kind of stop the project. But what normally happens, people just go with it anyway, right? And hope that the laptop they've produced will still sell somehow, even though it's much heavier than everybody else's laptops, right? However, if you have enough resources in terms of, let's say, time, in terms of money mostly, to go back in to change something, uh, then there is. This is the kind of a mental trap that I'm going to. What happens is, remember the problem solving saga. You had a you had a diff n numerous solution approaches. Let's say you selected some of the better ones, the best one, whatever that means. Now, when you go back, you need to s you need to make a choice. Do I explore new alternatives? So, do I find new ways to produce this microchip so that it's smaller or, or less power, uh, more power efficient? Or do I settle for kind of a suboptimal design? Right? So if you have to explore new alternatives, that would cost even more money. However, if you don't, if you just say, well, let's go back and, and take one of the solution candidates that we had before, this would actually cost you less money compared to what you've already invested, but uh, you would end up with a suboptimal solution. And in these situations, people tend to attribute extra credit to these suboptimal solutions in retrospect, right? So they go back and they think, well, this solution was not that bad after all. Maybe we should have chosen it the first time, so it, you know, it's cheaper and it's going to take us less time to implement. And you know, maybe, maybe the problem with more power or less, less more DPM defects per million is not such a big thing. We didn't estimate 
correctly the negative parts of this solution. So probably it will work out fine. So you settle for a, you don't really settle actually. You, you convince yourself that this suboptimal solution is good. Is better, at least better than, than you originally thought. And you do it. And then you end up with, with a, um, with, with something which is actually even more disastrous than, than if you had just stopped the project initially. So this is the, um, the way we, we call it here a mental trap in a sense. It's something that you have to be aware of. If you ever go back and you try to change something in your project and you find yourself attributing more weight or more credit to these solutions that initially you disregarded, then you're falling into this trap and it's kind of dangerous. And um, due to this, I mean, why is this the case? Obviously, you've invested a lot of resources in your project so far. And your ability, this graph shows this, your ability to change the project uh, is a lot less than in the beginning. So your freedom uh, is a lot less. What you can do is you can either invest a lot to change the whole project, or you just invest a little bit and you settle with a suboptimal solution. What this shows you is uh, kind of an abstract way of the relationship between your freedom of change and the progress of your project. So we have, as time goes, okay, this is just one phase, the development phase, but of course it could be any phase. Um, as time goes, your knowledge about the system Im increases. Right? Here you have only basic assumptions basic cost estimates, basic resource estimates, and then your knowledge about the system increases. Now it's going to cost you more. It's going to take you more time. Maybe I'll be late at the end. But your freedom at the end to change something is a lot less because you've already invested a lot in the project. And this is called this is what we call path dependence. More on this in, in the coming lectures. Um, but, you know, this is, I think this is pretty intuitive, right? Uh, it's only conceptual. For instance, if at the end of your, if, if during the writing of your master thesis, you suddenly realize that you didn't want to study physics, you wanted to study French literature, right? It's, it's too difficult, it's, it's too hard to change. The freedom that you can do is, yeah, maybe you can read a few French books, but you have to complete uh, your master thesis. Again, the other option is to invest a lot of resources ditch completely everything you've done so far and start studying French lit literature. And people do that, actually. They just suddenly realize that they wanted to do something else completely. Uh, actually, a former professor of mine used to kind of um, bring to our attention this potential conflict. So hopefully he, he mentioned this in the beginning, right? So. If you don't want to study, if you're not sure you want to study this, maybe you should change, which is a good advice, actually. But not a good advice if it's at the end. All right. <coughs> so I mentioned that quality control and also checking your milestones, going back and changing something is nothing more than a feedback loop. This is the, the, technical, the technical term. Okay, I have to speed up a little bit. Um, and what is a feedback loop? I think most of you, especially the engineers around you, are painfully familiar with, with feedback loops, especially the electrical engineers. Um, but a feedback loop is something, it's a very simple concept. You have a certain input which goes to your system. You take some of the output, say you take uh, your milestone, and you compare it to something that you expected. If this is not what you expected, you, t you change your input, right? And an example could be uh, with this heating, heating a room, right? You expect, you want 21 degrees, for instance. Obviously, now I want a little bit less. But if you want 21 degrees and you measure, let's say, 30 degrees, then you have to decrease your heating system. Next time you measure, maybe it's 19 degrees. It's too few, uh, it's too little, so you have to increase. All right, so let's continue after the break. Um, yes. All right, let's continue. Um,
Let me just set my timer here. So I told you about the feedback loops, what the feedback loop actually is. Um, in, um, in our course, let's say in um, judging how this kind of going back and fixing attitude, how it affects uh, your system, will distinguish between negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops. Without going into technicalities, in engineering, for instance, a negative feedback loop is something is is uh, um, going back and fixing something is what brings you to a balance, to an equilibrium kind of state, right? So you go back and you balance your input in a way that your output, uh, that in a way that your output goes to 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 the value or to the uh, milestone that you expected, right? For instance you set a quality standard. A negative feedback loop would be you go back, you fix something in your process so that this quality standard can be achieved. Right? A simple example, again, is the, uh, is the heating system, where you constantly try to bring the output to the desired temperature. This is a negative feedback loop. And um <coughs> other examples are, let's say, the standard supply and demand um, idea or the interrelationship between supply and demand in economics, for instance, right? If for some reason supply increases, then the price would go down and demand would increase as well. There would be a new equilibrium point. So this is this kind of a negative feedback idea. Uh, the, by the way, the human homeostasis works in the same way, right? The, the way that your body uh, regulates its temperature, it works in exactly the same way. You have a question? Okay, right. If you get too hot, then your body emits sweat. If you get too cold, then blood vessels close, and temperature is preserved in your system, which is actually pretty good. Now, positive feedback loops. It, it's kind of a terminology mix-up because in in reality, negative feedback is good. It's positive in a sense, but positive feedback loops are bad. Positive feedback loops lead to exploding behavior in your system. This explosion can go, you know, you can explode a certain value or you can decrease it to zero, but it's basically driving you away from equilibrium. Okay? Uh, all the bubbles are positive feedback loops. Self-fulfilling expectations are positive feedback loops. Right? You expect the house prices to go up, therefore you buy houses so that you can sell them at a high price later on, but buying houses causes the price to go up again, and then it goes up and up and up. Uh, eventually, uh, people realize this, this inflation and everything crashes, right? So these are positive feedback loops. But also, I mean, it doesn't have to be as abstract as this. If you take a, if you take a microphone and you go next to a loudspeaker, even if you don't talk, you would get this squeaking noise, right? Because the random noise, which is uh, like not perceived by you, gets amplified by the microphone comes out amplified from the speaker, gets picked up by the microphone again, gets amplified even more, gets picked up again, and then in a couple of milliseconds you have this explosion. So these are the positive feedback loops. And I would say, unfortunately, in, in big projects, each negative feedback loop that you want to establish in order to fix something is accompanied by a positive feedback loop, which destabilizes your system. Um, <coughs> We're going to see an example of this, but keep it in mind. Because what managers want to do is they constantly try to implement these negative feedback loops, but they sometimes don't know or they miss, they overlook the positive feedback loops, which actually can more than offset the gains from the negative feedback. And going back to this idea of feedback in general, I just want to show you um, the different kind of, um, let's say, the, the span of different feedbacks that you can have. Here we talk about quality feedback loops again, but imagine the following, right? Uh, let's say this is our, okay, this is our typical problem-solving cycle, uh, sorry, um, 
Yes, it's basically a problem solving cycle. So you set your objective, you come up with solution approaches, and then you implement this whatever solution, and this is the end of the project, right? So this could be just one little phase of your project. It could be just one little task in your project, like produce whatever software library. Um, so what happens is at the end, or some point, at some point of, of your project, um, you make a, you have a milestone defined, right? And then you compare, you control in a sense. Is the current output in this current time of the project phase or activity, is it what I expected? No. If it's not, well, then it, maybe this one is a bit better. This is the, the blue feedback loop. If not, then we need to change something. Project The project management task is to, ch to, to, to change something, to take uh, corresponding measures. For instance, uh, you see that you're going um, to be delayed, your project is going to be delayed, so measures could be you make people work overtime, for instance, or uh, you hire more people to do the job faster so that at the end you can, you can be on time. But some th So this is changes, feedback loops within your project, within your whatever the project may be. It may be an activity or whatever, right? So within your project. But there are also feedback loops uh, that go out of the project. And the, the, the idea is the following. So here, again, you do your controlling. You see that something is wrong. But now what is wrong is not uh, project-specific. Maybe what is wrong is the feasibility of your whole project. You know, this is the idea. Does it make sense to continue with that project anymore? Maybe it will be outdated by the time I've finished with it. And I won't be able to sell it, for instance. So what you need to do, there's nothing you can do in project management. There's, there, there's no overtime or more workers than you can hire. You need to go back to your planning stage and, and you need to, um, to ask yourself the question, well, does this project make sense now? If yes, what, can we, what do we change in the goals, in the goals of the project, in the aims of the project? So you go back to the very, very beginning, right? You realize you cannot sell this microchip because it's going to be too big. There is nothing you can do about it. You go back to the beginning and you design a smaller microchip. And then you go again in implementing this smaller microchip. So these are the, these two different uh, scopes of your feedback loops within the project itself. So incremental improvements, you might say. And those that span... Uh, let's say the environment, right? You estimate uh, the feasibility of your project uh, or the aims of that project, whether they still make sense. And now, as I promised you in the first lecture, we'll deal with um, these kind of small changes here, right? You need to constantly change something due to various reasons. Your, your customer wants you to change something. Uh, you, you realize that uh, you need to change something. So, in other words, in other words, uh, this one. In large-scale project management, for instance, uh, it, yes, the tunnel, the Gothard rail tunnel, right? It's a huge project. I think it's going to be completed 2015 or 2016 or something. It's going to be open for, for use. Um, I think it spanned, it started in 1991 or something. So it's a huge project. And you can imagine that in these big projects, even if everything goes according to plan and your customer doesn't want any changes to be done, there are still things happening that you cannot control. New technology is being developed. New regulation standards are being established. So suddenly your project needs to be, let's say, more environmental friendly. And you only realize this when you're in the middle of that, of that project. Or let's say your customer wants, um, wants to incorporate a new technology, like in the example we're going to see. So this kind of small, I mean, if you compare it to the scope and to the resources of the project, this kind of small changes, what is the effect of these small changes on the project? And the example that we're going to see is, illust is going to illustrate perfectly these small changes in court. So the question is, these small changes that you do, and sometimes there is no other way, but you have to do them, right? Even though everything is fine, new technology comes available and so on, do they add up 
and result linearly? Do they add up linearly and result in small impact, overall small impact? Or do they end up, add up through these feedback loops? And do they propagate and add up in a complicated nonlinear way uh, that eventually results in, in uh, the project cancellation? Right? So what is the impact of these small changes given these large-scale projects? And what is important also to realize is that these small changes are unavoidable in large-scale projects. They're simply things that you can't control in, uh, in life. Yes, so this is really a scientific question at the end of the day. Um, it's, not, it's not just um, a minor concern. We really need to know uh, the role of small changes. And the example, the running example for this lecture, one of the, yes, one of the l two running examples is the case with the shipbuilding company, Ingol Shipbuilding. Um, <coughs> so basically what happened is, and just in, in, your, in your notes, you have a reference to a book where this example was taken from. I will post the chapter of the book that deals with this. So there is a lot more information, you know, legal information, all this kind of stuff about the settings. But what happened is that this company, they won a contract from the U.S. Navy in, in, the, seven, in the beginning of the 70s to build uh, these ships, like 30 destroyers and 9 carriers. And that was a big deal at the time. Uh, you know that in the U.S. a lot of money are spent on defense, and there was a lot of money involved in this project. In fact, these, these were the only two projects, oh, I think two of the four projects that this company was working on, and all of the projects were from the U.S. Navy. Right, so this was a big thing for them. And the scope of this project was so huge that they had to double their workforce. At the end, they had 20,000 people working on building 30 destroyers and 9 carriers. I mean, 20,000 people. It's a huge amount of workers. And what happened when, I don't remember exactly the time, but I think the estimated time was about 15 years or something to build these things. What happened is, the U.S. Navy, being the customer, they constantly requested new technologies to, in to be incorporated. They always wanted to have the latest uh, GPS tracking ability and, and whatnot in, in their ships. So as new technology became available, they went back to, to the, to the Ingol manufacturer, uh, to the Ingol shipbuilding, and they, they requested these changes. At the end of the day, what happened is that the projected cost overrun was in the scope of 500 million US dollars. And just to put this number into perspective, uh, the turnover, the annual turnover of, of this uh, company was in about the same range, in the same ballpark, right? So basically, they would need, just to cover this project, they would need, in th let's say, the same amount of money as their total turnover for one year. Not profit, but turnover. So it was a big, big, big cost overrun which, of course, generated a conflict between the shipbuilding company and, uh, and the U.S. Navy. As you may imagine, the shipbuilders, they claim that all these small changes caused a lot of feedback loops in up, upstream. They caused a lot of you know, unexpected delays uh, and eventually resulted in this $500 million cost overrun. The U.S. Navy, on the other hand, they took the opposite position. They said, well, these are just small changes within a given task, so we're willing to pay whatever this kind of overwork for employees might have cost, the direct costs, but this in no way can be in the, in the range of 500 million. Right? Th these were just small changes, and uh, basically the company is at fault because they have bad project management. They don't allow enough buffers for their tasks, so if there is some delay, uh, they cannot handle this, so it's bad project management on their side. And what happened is actually the shipbuilder, the shipbuilding company, they sued the U.S. Navy. And since they're the, um, the plaintiff, they had to prove, actually, in court, that these small changes were the result, uh, resulted in, in this huge cost overrun. So they had to prove this. They hired um, 
a consulting company to develop, to model this whole process of building a ship, right? Um, and the basically, there's this conventional model. The way that the shipbuilding company was estimating <coughs> this, the, the effect of these small changes and all this kind of stuff uh, was done without taking into consideration any feedback loops, any propagating uh, or rippling effects from a small change. And this consulting company, they developed a system dynamics model. It's here. They develop a system dynamics model which takes into account all these uh, all these interrelationships bet between different tasks, especially feedback loops, right? And what happened at the end was they had this model. They could prove that these kind of small changes could result in a big overall impact. Then the shipbuilding company went to the U.S. Navy, presented the model, and... Basically, this was as a proof that uh, the U.S. Navy was at fault. The U.S. Navy, in fact, inspected this model, and I mean scrutinized the model, really. Uh, they came up with some criticism for the methodology, for the estimations of the costs of the different changes, different tasks, and so on. Uh, and they expected that these modifications would greatly reduce the impact of the small changes. But when the shipbuilding company implemented these, uh, these critics, the overall impact was actually higher. All right? So the U.S. Navy did not expect that by decreasing the cost of, of some of the tasks, they would actually get a higher impact. And at the end, actually, um, I just noticed yesterday that somewhere in your notes it says that the shipbuilding company won a lawsuit. There was no lawsuit at the end. They settled outside of court. And uh, they settled for four hundred and fifty million dollars out of five hundred, which is almost everything, right? So there was a. I found this out because I wanted to find the the, the court cases. You know, they're public, so I wanted to find them, but I couldn't find them. At the end, uh, it turns out that they settled outside of court. Okay, <coughs> so I will introduce the system dynamics model that these consultants consultants developed. Before doing that, um, there are a few kind of entities that exist in that model um, or structures, as you might call them. We distinguish between the following um, kind of activities. Not activities, but entities. Entities, I guess, is the right word. We have work to be done. right? So this is the work that needs to be done. You can estimate it in different ways. That's not so important. But there is an entity called work to be done. For instance, if I'm an important bureaucrat and I have to put stamps on a paper, right? the work to be done may be this pile of paper here that I need to stamp. The work being done here, the work being done, is the actual paper that I'm putting a stamp on. So this is the work that is currently in process. Uh, the work really done is the, the w completed work which has passed quality standards. Yeah, so this is where quality comes into play, right? You can, imagine, you can immediately see that this model incorporates this kind of quality concerns at every unit of work. Uh, and it turns out, I mean, these consultants also did some empirical, empirical work later on. They found out that the... the work really done the first time in uh, in commercial in the commercial in the industry is 68% so 70% of all the work is really done in a quality way the first time no no need for feedback but in the military projects it's appalling it's 35% so it's a huge i mean as you might expect i guess it's a huge you know deficiency in in in, in this kind of military projects and so what happens, once, once you realize that your work done does not conform to quality standards, then the question is, okay, what needs to be changed? And the thing that needs to be changed is the work, uh, it's referred here as the undiscovered rework. So you, now you know that you have to do something which you didn't know before, before the quality check. 
again, before going into the details of the model, let me introduce in a more kind of system dynamics perspective how these models look like in general. What the entities that we're going to be working with, and eventually you'll have to simulate this in your self-studies, are called basically stocks and flows. Stocks, this is a stock, right? Stock is something, is basically an entity or a quantity which accumulates value over time, right? The work to be done is a stock because it accumulates over time. As more work becomes available, it's a stock variable or it's a stock quantity. The rate of change of this stock quantity is called a flow. So if you have the work to be done as a stock variable, the work which is currently being done, so the work which is taken out of the stock variable and currently being processed, like the sheet of paper that I take to put a stamp on, is called a flow because it reduces your stock variable. In the same way, the work which goes, for example, I put my sheet of paper on the work done stock variable. This would be called also a flow because it increases the corresponding stock variable. So we work with stock and flows, and this is called inflow and outflow. It's pretty intuitive, right? So for example, um, the flow of materials, like the flow of papers that I get, is a flow variable. Um, this could be the pile of processed papers, or let's say this could be the, this is the work to be done, this is the papers that come to me for stamping, and this is, you know, somebody is giving, is constantly replenishing this pile of papers that I have to work on, right? So, like, citizens giving me bureaucratic things to do. All right. We can put this whole model into equations. I mean, that's how they, they express them in system dynamics. The stock variable here, the change of uh, the, the, the value of the stock variable at any point of time is simply the total sum of all the inflows and all the outflows up to this time, right? So this is a, don't be intimidated by this kind of, this kind of equations. Um, you will not have to produce these kind of equations in the, in the exam, although it will help. Um, yes? the work really done? It depends on, on how you structure your project. If you have the work really done, what do you do with it? That's the question. Maybe you, you give it to somebody else for further processing. Maybe you send, you send these pieces of paper by, email, by, by mail to people. So it depends what, what your project is. Yes, yes, for sure. If you have a stock variable which is called work done, but not checked for quality, and if you discover a mistake in this, uh, I when you check for quality, you discover something, some task was done wrong, then of course this outflow, you take this task, you put it to another stock variable which may be called work to be redone, right? Because it's a, it's a faulty thing. So this would also be an outflow. So yes, mistakes, discarded mistakes could also be an outflow. It's all conceptual. I mean, it's all up to you how you define your stocks and your flows. But this is the idea. If something accumulates over time, it's a stock. If it's just a temporal or uh, instantaneous flow, uh, yeah, right, it's kind of a double definition. But you, you got the point. So the stock is simply the, the net sum of the... Uh, or the, the, the net difference between the everything that goes into a stock and that goes out of the stock, and you sum this, basically integral is just a sum, uh, you sum this over uh, all the preceding time. And of course, we have some starting value for the stock, right? In some cases, your stock variable, your work to be done already exists when you got the project, if you're that unfortunate uh, project manager. All right. We can, so this is the integral way to describe this, by a sum. You can also describe it in a differential way. And the question here is, how does my stock change with time? You know, before the question was, what is the total value of the stock at this given time? Now the question is, how does it change with time? 
Uh, well, it's, it's much simpler. There are no integrals. At any given point of time, the change in your stock would be the difference between what goes in and what comes out. Okay? All right. So with this in mind, that is a, the basic concept of the system dynamics model that these consultants developed. <coughs> of course, the whole model is it's completely out of scope of this lecture. Um, and even uh, in the book, you can't find the, the whole model. I have uploaded a paper in the literature section today, which is written by one of the consultants working on this project. There you can find more details about the model. Uh, in terms of uh, you know more um, real life examples for not real life examples but more uh, yeah kind of quantitative details regarding all the entities here. If you want to read it, of course you're welcome to do so. Uh, but the important point is to understand the the concept, and the concept is the following. As I mentioned, these guys said the following. Well, let's model the work to be done as a stock variable, right? So this is a stock. We have a work to be done in any project. We also have the work really done. So what is the difference between work to be done and work to be uh, work really done? Well, that's the quality check that you do. Right? This is the basic feedback loop. You have something that needs to be done, you do it. Right? You do it here. Work being done, I put a stamp on the paper, and then somebody checks whether this stamp was aligned correctly, for instance. If that's the case, then my other stock variable, work really done, increases by whatever amount. If that's not the case, however, if something doesn't work, then you put it in a stock variable which is called, you know, doesn't work. You don't know why, it just doesn't work. You take this stock variable, then maybe somebody else takes this stock variable, some other team, and they discover what is the problem with this thing, what needs to be changed. And they put it in a stock variable called known rework. So this is work which does not conform to quality standards and you know how to fix it, right? This is work which does not conform, you, you don't know how to fix it. And then again, the known rework goes back to the process of work being done. So it's kind of a, another inflow to that goes to the quality check later on, right? This is clear. So you see the feedback loop. This is the feedback loop, the quality feedback loop that we talked about here. But now what is interesting to see is that you have work which is really being done. You have built one, or let's say, 10 meters of your tunnel, or you've produced five libraries of your software product and then suddenly your customer comes and says well I want you to to change this you know I, I want now uh, my product to have this latest GPS tracking capabilities for instance which wha what happens is you take some of the work which is really done and you need to change that right to incorporate the customer changes which goes back to the stock variable known rework. So it's not defect per se, but it still needs to be changed in some way. And then it goes here. So this is the, diff the second feedback loop, this one, which is entirely due to customer changes here. All right. And basically the bullet points are everything, everything that I said so far. Therefore, <coughs> I think it would be easier, so basically this slide explains that diagram. And I think it would be easier to just start with that diagram and only later on for your own reference you can refer to, you can refer to this slide. But this is a more detailed example of the system dynamics model that they developed. And at this point let me, let me just remind you what the system dynamics model is. You model the whole system. Right, you don't model the individual interactions between, you know, people or between project managers. You model your whole system uh, 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 from from kind of a bird's eye perspective. So here we have the typical, uh, the the familiar stock variables, work to be done, non rework, and so on. Now, what happens? I think it would be easier to remove this. <coughs> what happens if 
your customer comes and requests small changes from you, or some changes. Let's say um, I wanted to incorporate this new new functionality because this is getting popular nowadays. It will be important in 15 years. So what happens is, well, you try to create the so-called negative feedback loops. In, in other words, you try to, to fulfill these, these requests, right? So what happens is, well, you hire more people, right? This is one thing that managers can do. You hire more people so they can work more and uh, they will kind of finish, they, they will be able to do this additional work at the same time. So we hire more people here. This would affect, uh, it's, don't worry about the technical term for people. Uh, you'll see this, but for now, just remember stock flows and we have people here. So you hire more people and this will obviously increase the work being done. Right, this is intuitive. What you can also do, however, is you can make the current people or the, the current workforce, workforce uh, to work more, to do some overtime. Right, right? It again, well, you know the 90 hour week mentality in one of the companies in Silicon Valley when it was being established. Right, so you, over you, you ask your people to work more and uh, again, this would affect the work currently being done. Another thing that you can do as a manager, well, you can accelerate the schedule, which would uh, hopefully increase the productivity of your people. And then again, it increases the work being done. So you, you try to, uh, of course, these are just examples. The, uh, in the real model, they had different things. But you see how you try to make some project management changes which bring you closer to the goal that you want to achieve. These are the negative feedback loops. But as I told you, each negative feedback loop is a, uh, accompanied by a positive feedback loop, which destabilizes the whole system. For instance, you hire more people. M maybe in your vicinity of your company, the skilled workforce is not that prevalent. So uh, you end up hiring less quality people. Right, the average employee skill goes down, which, so these are the dotted lines, these are the positive feedback loops, which would affect your productivity in the mid to long term. I mean, what do you do with these people if they're not as skilled as your hiring standards? What do you do with them? Maybe their work that they're actually doing is not as good. So you need, you would increase that feedback here, the quality feedback. So this is one example. You ask people to work overtime. What may happen is they get tired, they burn out, suddenly some of your best people start to leave the company, uh, they go to the competitors. So this again, uh, this would affect your productivity. right? Another example is you accelerate the schedule. Basically you ask people to, to do more things in parallel for instance which causes congestion, people piling, uh, people uh, waiting for to use the same machine, for instance, coordination problems, obviously. If things now need to be done in parallel, then they have to be coordinated, all this kind of stuff. And uh, it causes also morale problems. Like obviously, people get demotivated. So you see, these are just an examples of a positive feedback loop, which accompanies each negative feedback loop. And in the system dynamics model that these guys developed, um, they, they had these things incorporated. So by doing this, as I told you, they were able to prove to the, to U to the US Navy that these small changes re uh, resulted in unexpected, unintended consequences, which is one of the characteristics of complex systems. When we try to influence a complex system, there are unintended consequences that sometimes, even with the best efforts, we, we cannot predict. But there is still a lot we can do. There is still a lot we can, um, we can predict by trying to think about these kind of feedback loops, uh, positive and negative feedback loops. Lessons learned from these examples uh, is that small changes can ripple down or ripple across your whole project, all the phases and result in big delays. 
Um, <coughs> yes, so basically I've, I've said all this. We <laughs> tend to neglect the indirect effects. We tend to neglect them because, first of all, obviously they're more difficult to spot. They take more time to spot. Uh, so we just simply tend to, uh, to ignore them. These were the effect of small changes. Now, I need to speed up a bit. Now, um, we, we come up to another optimization kind of technique. So far, we've dealt primarily with either fully sequential tasks, fully sequential uh, also in the project phases. We saw one phase follows another phase, another phase from upstream to downstream. Uh, the critical path method assumes sequentiality or full concurrency. But what if all these different phases, conceptualization, design, development, and decommissioning of your project, for instance, all these phases, they, I mean, they don't need to be sequential. And in fact, this goes into the direction of um, uh, concurrent development. Some of you may be familiar with this. So you do part of the design phase at the same time with, with let's say, part of the, the production work needed. Right? So these different phases do not need to happen sequentially. And this is the, this idea of cross-function or concurrent development mm, where you basically try to study the network of your phases. So the phases, the different, f actually I should go like this, the different phases in your project are not sequential, but they're kind of assembled in a network. So they, they can some of them can be done in concurrency, in, in a concurrent way, in parallel. So imagine, yes, we have the product definition, the design, the uh, and the product testing and quality control phases, for instance. And these guys, uh, I think, yes, uh, you can find the paper of, of, of these guys in the literature section, but they propose the following thing. Maybe that would be easier to see. They said, well, no matter how many phases, so this was the goal, remember, we need to study how the different phases in your project can be done concurrently and to what extent they can be done concurrently and also which projects in types of industries and stuff like this can be done concurrently. So they said, well, no matter how many project phases we have, of course it's up to you as a, as a project manager, it's up to your industry to define different phases that you need to do. But within each phase, within each phase, we have more or less the following, they call them subsystems, or let's say different categories of tasks that you need to do within each subsystem, uh, within, uh, within each phase. And here they've, they've talked about, um, they, they named this uh, process, process structure phase. So this is a phase uh, where you basically think about what work needs to be done in this phase. Like if it's a design phase, you think about, well, what do designers need to do? If that's a production phase, what do the manufacturing guys need to do? Uh, then you have a kind of a category or a subsystem which is called resources. So these are the available resources. You have the scope of that phase. What is the scope of your design? You just want to design whatever uh, product. And you have your quality target, mostly quality targets, but also, of course, time, uh, time targets and budget targets. And all of these different subsystems affect the actual performance of that phase. The actual performance in terms of cycle time, defect rate, and cost. Cycle time is basically how many times you have to um, go back. Uh, ignore the feedbacks for now. The, the point is here that each of these subsystems affect the performance in a direct way. For instance, the available resources affect your performance because, of course, the resources are limited. So you can only do your project or you can only accomplish that phase uh, in that time. You cannot do it any faster because you just don't have enough resources. Like for instance, uh, so you each of these subsystems affect the performance in a direct way, but also the different subsystems affect each other. For instance, the work that needs to be done in that phase generates demand, generates demand for resources. Right? This is how you affect the resources. If you, if, if you need to 
to design, uh, uh, let's say, a DRAM memory, the resources you need are a lot less than if you need to design a GPU latest generation, for instance. Right? So the different subsystems affect each other. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, let's see, do I need to go through that? Yes, quickly, actually. So these are the different phases that you can have in your project. For instance, you can have product definition, design, prototype testing, uh, and quality control. And as I, this is basically the multi-phase projects. Each phase influences each other directly. And by influence, I mean depend on each other. For example, product prototyping, of course, you need to have a design already in place. And of course, you need to have some kind of product definition. Sometimes even without design, you can do some testing, uh, you can do some prototypes uh, only with uh, having the product definition. But also, the quality loop comes into play. If something doesn't work here, then you need to go back and you need to change something in your design, and so on. So this is, um, uh, this is the, this feedback actually. This feedback is what we don't like, right? We never like to go back and to change something. And this is what it's called, uh, the feedback uh, corruption, in a sense. All right, let's see now. So these guys, they focused only on the work that needs to be done in a given phase. They focused only on this work and they tried to model it in a system dynamics way. And they did this. So what we have here are all the tasks which are not completed, that needs to be done, so all the design work that you need to do, they're completed at some rate, and th they go to another stock variable, which is called tasks completed uh, but not checked. Then you check the tasks for quality. This is the quality loop here. If the quality is fine, then they move to the tasks which are approved, and then finally you release the tasks for the next phases, or for the next yeah, for the next phases, most likely, right? So this is the idea we already saw. Uh, now I will go move to the important stuff. This is uh, this is just that picture, put in a different way. I will skip that because we're running out of time. But back to the original question: How much of your different phases can be done concurrently? And not only can different phases be done concurrently, but the work within each phase, so the design work, for instance, in the design phase, it can be done, so different activities there can be done concurrently as well. And these guys came up with the following way to visualize that. Here we have percent of the work which is done, and it passes quality control. Here. Here we have percent which is done, and passes quality control, plus what is available for completion. For instance, if you have a, let's say, a software product, and this is, in fact, this curve is an example. If you have a software product, in fact, this is an example from a software product. Uh, in that particular example, it was split in different blocks. You know, normally you, you don't do the uh, big software projects. At one time, they're split in different blocks. And ideally, all the blocks can be done concurrently in parallel, right? This is the design phase or the implementation phase. All of them could be done concurrently. This is the ideal phase. The most non-ideal case is when they have to be done in sequence. In that particular case, they needed to do 20% of the blocks, of the software blocks, 20%, before they can parallelize all the others, right? So unless you complete 20% of the work, you cannot do anything else. All the others have to wait. All the other 80% have to wait. This is what is illustrated here. Unless you do 20% of the work, this is 20%. The work which is available for you to do is, or, so the work which is available for you to do plus the work which is already being done is just, again, 20%. Right? You, you understand that? You start at zero. For, for instance, you haven't done anything. What is the work available for you to do? It's not 100%, it's just 20%. Um, <clears throat> I just want to finish with that slide, which is one of the last slides. 
and we'll talk about these slides in the self-study actually. I will explain them in more details, but this is actually a very, very nice slide. What it shows you is, uh, now these are different phases of your project. And you know that different phases can be done concurrently. Let's say the design phase can be done, some of it can be done concurrently with the production phase. So what they, these guys did, they asked, uh, they asked the designer in the design phase, they asked the design manager again in the design phase, they asked the product architect and a strategic marketing guy, which is part of the product definition phase, what in their opinion is the level of concurrency between product definition and design. So they ask, for instance, the marketing guys, which are responsible for product definition. What do you think the concurrency between your face and the design face is? In other words, how much work do you think you need to complete before the design guys can start working? What this means is that the marketing guy really thought that he or she needed to do only a little bit of work, let's say only 1%, or let's say this is 10%, if they only do 10% of their work, then the design guys should be able to do 40% of their available work. So they thought that they only need to do a little for the design people to start working a lot. This is what basically they thought. And you, saw, you see actually, and, and the same with the product architect, but you see the design people actually had a completely different opinion. They thought that the, de the product definition guys should do a lot of work before the design people can start doing just a little bit. Right? So this is a very nice uh, uh, conflict of interest, you may say, a conflict of perception, uh, which was made, uh, made known by, by this approach. Now, yeah, this is not so important, and the summary. So we didn't have so much time this time, uh, this lecture. Uh, there were a lot of things to explain. I will come back to slides which are not clear. And I mean, even if you understand everything, I would still address some of the slides on Tuesday in the self-study. And basically, if you just look at the figures in the papers uh, that are available, all these slides are there. But in principle, you shouldn't be able to do it. Uh, you shouldn't have to do it. Thank you.